Great. Well, um, well um, uh, Dr. McGarry, thank you for, for inviting us. Um, I'm really happy to be here because uh, it means that I made it. And that, and that the academic world is now uh, reaching out to little old me who uh, owns and operates When Hounds Fly Dog Training in Toronto. Our school is just at Dundas West in Ossington. And the reality is most of what I do day to day is I work with pet dog owners. So I work with people that get puppies or just get a new rescue dog from the shelter and they just want their dog to come when called at the park, walk nicely on leash, and maybe sit and not jump on people when they come over. So that's what uh, I do and my colleague Katie Hood, we do on a day-to-day -day basis. However, uh, why I'm here is because although I'm working with pet dog owners for very sort of like common everyday stuff, the foundation and the principles behind the methods we use to teach our animals come straight out of the academic world. And specifically, I want to sort of trace um, you know, our, our processes back to the work of B.F. Skinner. So everything we do um, comes from behaviorism um, as first defined by guys like B.F. Skinner. So a big part of our world, and I'm just, this is where I'm just going to introduce some of the terminology I'm going to use today, is things like the four quadrants of operant conditioning. So positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, positive punishment, and negative punishment. That's a big part of what we do. And uh, today I'm going I'm to try to, through some dog training exercises, demonstrate some of those principles. Now, B.F. Skinner first worked uh, with uh, species such as rats and pigeons, for the most part. Dogs weren't a big part of uh, their, um, you know, the species they trained with. And continuing sort of the history lesson briefly, um, B.F. Skinner had two students, uh, the Breelins, that really started working with a wide variety of animals, uh, all sorts of different species, and ended up training animals for uh, military applications and film and all sorts of stuff. Uh, it wasn't until the 80s and 90s where, um, actually before that, uh, the next person that, uh, that I owe, that we owe as dog trainers, um, that we owe a, a ton of gratitude towards, uh, is another scientist named Karen Pryor. So Karen Pryor uh, basically took the work of uh, B.F. Skinner and the Breelands and introduced operant conditioning as a training methodology to the marine mammal world. So this is probably where a lot of people are familiar with uh, animal training, in that you've probably seen a show where a dolphin like jumps through a hoop and the animal trainer blows a whistle. And after the animal comes down from the jump, uh, the animal trainer throws like a fish into the, into the dolphin's mouth. Now, that's where we can start drawing parallels between uh, marine mammal training and that work into uh, the world of animal training. So, marine mammal trainers will use a whistle and a piece of fish to reinforce behavior. Dog trainers, thanks to uh, the continued work of people like Karen Pryor in the 80s and 90s, use, uh, commonly use a device called a clicker, which is the equivalent of the whistle in the marine mammal world. And then today, PD is working for little pieces of chicken wiener. Uh, that's his fish. So let me spend a few seconds talking a little bit about uh, the clicker and this food and how it all ties in. So. Um, uh, food, uh, in, 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 a, in uh, academic terms, would be considered a, a, uh, an unconditioned reinforcer, or sorry, stimulus, an unconditioned stimulus. Um, the dog doesn't need to be taught that food is important. Food is important to the dog intrinsically. Like, they have to eat. And dogs specifically are very hungry, and Petey is a very hungry dog. So he values these little bits of hot dog. Now, in the case of the dolphin, the whistle, or in the case of a dog, this clicker, there is no intrinsic value in a whistle to a dolphin. Right? It has no meaning. A clicker has no meaning to a dog until you've created, uh, until you've conditioned uh, meaning to the clicker. So every time I click, it leads to, in a couple seconds, the consumption of an unconditioned uh, stimulus. So this becomes uh, a, conditioned, uh, a conditioned stimulus. It has meaning because it means to the dog, food is coming, reinforcement is coming. So, so why do we bother using a clicker in animal training? Why don't we just feed the, feed the animal straight away and forget about this clicker business or the whistle? 
Well, if the dolphin is in the air, in the middle of a jump, going through a hoop, they are doing the behavior that we're trying to, in operant conditioning terms, positively reinforce. But I can't put a fish in a dolphin's mouth when they're midair in a jump. I have to feed them later when they come back down. So the role of a clicker or a whistle, or a, a marker signal, as it's commonly termed, or a bridging stimulus, as it's also sometimes referred to in the literature, is to connect the behavior, in this case, jump in the air, with the reinforcement, so fish or hot dog, that is consumed later. So therefore, the animal learns that the behavior is jump in the air. Hold on a second. <laughs> He's going to jump in the air in a second. Um, the behavior is jump in the air. That's the behavior we mark with the signal, the, the, the bridging stimulus. The reinforcement will be fed after. So if I wanted this little guy to jump, I'm going to cue him to jump off and touch my hand. I will click when he jumps, and I will feed him after he lands, because I can't put a hot dog in his mouth midair. So let's, uh, let's do that as an example of one behavior. Hold on, hold on. Sit. Okay, wait. Okay, off. So I click at the jump. That's the behavior I'm reinforcing. The consumption of the hot dog comes after. Similarly, if I wanted him to go back up, I'll do the same. PD, up. So I clicked for the behavior of the jump, dot, 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 <laughs> fish goes in dolphin's mouth, so to speak. Does that make sense? So that's, what a, a, that's why clickers and whistles are so important. They bridge the behavior we were positively reinforcing, right, from our OC term, with the consumption of reinforcement that has to, in the real world, happen later. So, um, that's, so this is teaching jump and little tricks like this. But of course we can teach basic pet dog stuff, like. Uh, sit, lay down, stay, and so on and so forth. So, um, the next thing that I want to uh, talk about, uh, and this is where, like, as an animal trainer, like, I really like to geek out. Karen Pryor, who again is uh, the scientist who we sort of credit with bringing this form of training into marine mammal and then ultimately animal, like, dog training. Um, she wrote in 1969, I think, uh, a paper called. Um, Training Novel Behaviors in Porpoises. Um, the idea, what she was trying to experiment with was, how can we teach animals to actually be creative and, teach them, and have them learn how to offer novel behavior? So a lot of the cool, like, amazing tricks you see in marine mammal training, that's because of some of that work that she did in the 60s and 70s. So the game that she documented in that paper uh, is a game called 101 Things to Do with a Box. So let me describe what we're going to do with the little box that I brought today with PD. So I'm going to place a box in the workspace, and I'm going to wait for him to do a behavior that I like. And the first behavior I'm going to click for is put your nose in the box. If I see him put his nose in the box, I'm going to click and feed for it. Could you want to get off? Okay, off. I'm going to click and feed for him putting his nose in the box. And what I'm trying to do is teach him that, you know, of all the behaviors you can do with the box right now, what I want you to do is put your nose.